let's just get into it. Any thought or mindset like that, like you have to jump through hoops or like God is looking over you or God is ignoring you, any mindset like that is straight from hell. This video was brought to you in full by the Holy Spirit. What's going on guys? Welcome back to the channel. I got a pretty interesting one today. How do you get God's attention? I can honestly say, I don't think I've ever been asked this question, but let's address it. Guys, it's not clickbait. It's not a joke, I promise. It's the truth. How do you get God's attention? You already have it. You already have his attention. Let's just dive right into it. If you've ever been in a place in your life where you felt like you did not have God's attention, you felt like God wasn't looking at you, God was looking past you, or God was ignoring you, God forbid you ever feel that way, all of those things are lies you have God's fullest attention. You do not have to do anything to get God's attention. You don't have to strive for it. You don't have to jump through hoops to get it. You already have God's attention. His eyes are already on you. I think it's really important that we dive into where that mindset would come from. How, how do we get, how do those feelings come up? How do we get that mindset of God's not looking at me, God's forgot about me, and, and that I have to try to do something to get God's attention? Here's a little test. Ask yourself, why do I think I do not have God's attention? I can almost guarantee you that the first thoughts that come to your mind are all about self and not related to God. And by that, I mean the reasons that you think in your head that God is not giving you his attention, they're all about you. They're all about your actions. They're all about the things that you've done. Have you done enough for God to be pleased at you? Are you doing something to where God would say, now he has my attention. I'm proud of him. Let me focus my attention on him. When you ask yourself that question, all the attention gets turned to you. That's a pretty good indication that you're looking in the wrong direction to answer that question. Like if I said you had to answer that question but you couldn't have an answer that involved you, what would your answer be? So why isn't God paying any attention to you? He's busy? Well, yeah, maybe. I mean, he's busy. He, he you know, he runs the universe and, and everything, but you think he's too busy for you. Maybe he forgot. Yeah, no, that's not it. Well, maybe he's mad. Why would he be mad? Well, because I'm- Nope, broke the rules, got you. Not allowed to include yourself. Honestly, I can't even think of an answer that would involve God that is not directly tied to me, like a reason that God would have not to give me his attention that wasn't me just shining a mirror or a spotlight on myself trying to look at my own actions. Let's just get into it. Any thought or mindset like that, like you have to jump through hoops or like God is looking over you or God is ignoring you, any mindset like that is straight from hell. Here's why. That entire thought process, all of those thoughts are designed to get you to be more self-focused. What am I doing? What can I do for God to get him to turn his attention to me? None of those thoughts are Christ-focused. All of those thoughts, all of those thoughts are even designed to get you to be self-focused and not Christ-focused. Here is the super subtle, tricky, trick, lie, forward slash, deception that the devil is trying to get us to buy into. He is trying to get you to be more self-focused. He's trying to get you to believe that if you do a certain thing, or if you do these things, or if you act a certain way, or in general, if you just looked different or behaved different, then you would really have God's attention. Then his eyes would really be on you. And the dangerous part about that is whether we know it or not, we are trying to work to earn God's love. Come here. Come here. Spoiler alert, the devil does not want you to receive God's love. He wants you to constantly be analyzing yourself and be self-focused and looking at your righteousness and your good works instead of looking at Christ and living your life in Christ and through him. If you're still not convinced that that is not a godly mindset, look at the entire redemption plan. It was not about how many hoops can I get mankind to jump through until they receive Christ. The entire redemption plan was about one man, Jesus, and him jumping through all the hoops. Not literally, but him being righteous, him being holy, him wearing sonship, and him doing all the things so that he could provide a salvation and a righteousness and for us to live out those things in him because he knew that we were going to fall short. It wasn't about, he knew that we couldn't jump through. If he put one hoop, we couldn't jump through one hoop, much less all the hoops. So he said, I'm going to send my son. My son is going to live out this life perfectly. And so you can live your life in Christ. So it wasn't about 
us jumping through hoops to try to get God's attention. It was about one man and the attention of one man. I think it's fairly safe to say that Jesus had God's attention. Does the Bible not say that we are in Christ? If Jesus had, if Christ had God's attention and we're in Christ, I'm pretty sure we got God's attention too. I talked about this in one of my earlier videos, but look at Adam and Eve in the garden. When Adam and Eve sinned, God was well aware that they sinned. God knew that they disobeyed. God knew they ate the fruit. God knew that they fell short. And look at what God's reaction was. God didn't say, well, they better show me some kind of repentance here pretty soon or else, you know, well, I'm just going to ignore them until they decide that they're ready to fess up to what they did because, you know, I, I just, I'm God and I can decide. No, he didn't do that. They were the ones that ran from God. They were the ones that didn't want to be in his presence. He was ready to be in their presence. He desired to be around them. They had his attention. His eyes were on them. They didn't know it. And that was in a completely fallen state. That was when they fell short. That was when they messed up. So to have this idea that we have to reach this level of perfection before we have his attention is just a lie. It's just a trick of the enemy to try to get us to run from God, to try to rob us of our closeness from God. When in all reality, just like Adam and Eve in the garden, even though they messed up, even though that they had fell short and they were in a fallen state, the presence of God and God's heart and God's love was still there and actually chasing them and longing to be with them. This is what we have to remember. We all know, or we should know, that God loves us unconditionally. That means without condition. It's not tied to something that you did. It's not based on conditions from you. That love is a perfect love. It doesn't get over it or it, <laughs> over. I'm over it. I'm over it. It doesn't get over it. It doesn't get burned out. He doesn't get frustrated. He doesn't get aggravated. Look at 1 Corinthians 13 and you will not find any of those things on the list. It is patient. It's long suffering. It's kind. It's not self-absorbed. None of those things describe some attributes that sometimes we try to put on love. So we say, we love our spouse or we love our friends, yet we can get frustrated, we can get aggravated. I'm sorry, but that's not real love. That's not God's kind of love. God never gets frustrated with us. He's never aggravated with us because love is patient, love is kind. It can't be that. So if God's love is unconditional, God's love doesn't have anything to do with, with me proving myself to be worthy of his love. And the whole concept of you having God's attention is based on the idea that you don't have his attention or that he turned his head away from you and he's not paying attention to you. The thing we have to remember is that God's love is unconditional and it's perfect. There is no reason that he would ever turn his attention away from you. It doesn't matter what you've done. It doesn't matter what you do. You could be in the middle of a mess right now, but his love is unconditional, which means he's not loving you based on you being perfect. He loves you outside of that. He loves you even in a mess. Every second of every day, God longs to spend time with you. His eyes are constantly on you. He is forever watching you. Psalms 139 says that the thoughts that God has about you could outnumber the grains of sand that are on the earth. And that means that either the psalmist David was exaggerating, which is another word for lying, or the Bible is telling the truth. And the thoughts that God has for me actually outnumber the grains of sand on the earth, which is a billion, trillion, million, zillion, trillion, a number that we can't even fathom. And if God is love, that means that every thought that he has for me and he has for you is nothing but thoughts that come out of love about how much he loves you, how much he wants you to succeed, how much he wants you to walk in his righteousness that he provided, how much he wants you to understand how much he loves you. As sons and daughters, this is what our job is. We have to recognize that we already have God's attention. John 8, 32 says, you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. If you feel like you do not have God's attention, if you feel like God has looked over you, he's forgotten about you, or he's ignoring you, then that is a mindset you want to break free from. You want freedom from that mindset. You want freedom from that, the negative emotions that that's causing you. It's making you sad. It's making you want to push away from God because you believe that God is pushing and distance himself from him, uh, distancing himself from you. If you want freedom from that, you need truth. The Bible says, You'll know the truth and that will set you free. 
If you want freedom, you need truth. Here's the thing. The word know in this verse is not just talking about a knowledge like, yeah, I know, I read it one time and I know, I've heard that before. The word know in this verse is talking about a knowing with experience. This is the first illustration that popped in my mind and, and it's kind of weird, but here it goes. So if I read a book, <laughs> that's very unlikely. So if, if you tell me, or if I read it in a book or something like that, if you break both of the bones in your arm simultaneously, that is going to be painful. I will then know that. I know that. I know that if I break both the bones in my arm, eventually, after the shock wears off, that's going to be painful. You probably know that as well. However, I've never broken any bones in my arm, much less both the bones in my arm at the same time. So I've never experienced that. So I can say I know that, but if tomorrow, I can't, I can't even, <laughs> I can't, I can't do it. I can't say it. Okay, let me put it to you this way. If I was a person who had broken both the bones in their arm at the same time, I could tell you that I know that that hurts, but the way that I know it is a knowing through experience. I've experienced that. I don't just know it. I've been through it. I know it in the court. That's what I'm talking about. A knowing with experience. So when the Bible says you will know the truth, it's not just a, a fact that you had read. It's a knowing because you've experienced it. So here's what we all try to figure out. How do we get something that's a fact or a biblical truth that is head knowledge into an experiential knowledge? And here's the answer. You walk it out. Practically, this is what it looks like. Tomorrow, when you wake up in the morning, have your Bible open to Psalm 139. Or pick a verse that talks about the, the concept of how much God loves you or how much God's eyes are on you or how much attention from Him you have. Another one of my favorites is Romans chapter 8, verse 35, 38, 39. And what shall separate me from the love of God? And then he goes through this huge list and he says, there is nothing that can separate me from the love of God. I can read that and know that if he loves me that much that nothing can separate me from his love, I know I have his attention. So this is what you do. This is how we walk it out. This is how we turn it from a head knowledge to an experiential knowledge. After you read that verse or while you're reading that verse, I want you to pray and pray it out loud. Say, Father God, I thank you that I have your attention. Thank you for your love. Thank you and start, start communing with God. But make sure when you commune with him, it's not militant. Like read a verse and say, God, thank you for your... Know that you're talking to your Father God. You're having a conversation. He's in the room and say, Father God, thank you that I have your attention. When I open my mouth, before I ever even go to open my mouth, you're here waiting. I have your attention. Thank you, God, that I, ha I have your attention. Above that, I have your love. I know that if you love me, you, you've given me your attention. I have your approval. And just start communing with God. Start confessing, not I confess that I... No, not like that. Not like, not like just a... Okay, listen. This is probably the most important thing that I'm going to say on this video. The Bible is not a magic spell book. You don't read a verse and then quote it like abracadabra and then all of a sudden... <laughs> I'm sorry, but, but that's the way it is sometimes. We've thought like that sometimes. Like, like we quote a verse and then after we quote a verse, we sit back like it's an abracadabra or like it's a magic spell book, like waiting for all, automatically for your feelings to change or for your mindset to change. When we commune with God, when we talk out loud, we're having a conversation. It's not a magic spell book. We're not saying abracadabra. And along those lines, also, after you get done communing with God, after you read the word, if you sit back and you're like, well, I don't feel any different, don't think that just because you don't feel any different that what you're doing is pointless. That's how we've got called up in this whole, I'm trying to tread lightly, but I don't know how else to say it other than to say we treat the Bible like a like an abracadabra, like a magic book. When we talk to God, when we read a scripture out loud and we make a confession, we do it in faith. The Bible says we walk by faith. Everything we do is by faith. This is what that means. We read a scripture. We have a little communion with God. We, we make some confessions out loud. God, thank you that you love me. We don't really feel any different, but we walk that thing out in faith, which means when, when your mind starts playing tricks on you and saying, see, nothing changed. See, God's not really in the room. This is where we have a part to play. You have to put faith in what you're doing. Faith is this, another word for faith is just believe. We have to believe, we have to trust that we are, we have to trust that we are making a connection with God. We have to put faith in the words that we are actually saying. So if you say, God, I just believe that you love me. God, I believe that I have your attention. 
and you get done praying and you don't feel any different and your mind starts telling you that was pointless, you have to put faith in what you did and, and walk that thing out by faith and say, nope, I know that God loves me. I know that God loves me. I know I have God's attention. I just read it. It's right here in my Bible. I believe my word. That's where the good fight of faith comes in. And that's what walking it out looks like. But that's also how you get from a head knowledge to an experiential knowledge. Because if you can test in the faith, if you stay in the faith and you don't let all of the lies of the enemy overtake you and say no god really doesn't love you and you ask the holy spirit help you fight those emotions help you fight all the negative thoughts that you keep having and you stay consistent and you stay strong you will realize that one day you will wake up and nobody will be able to talk you out of the fact that you have god's attention but it takes walking that out. It takes being willing to sit on your bed or to sit in your office, wherever you're at, and read your Bible and talk out loud. Please talk out loud. Please pray out loud and talk to God and say, God, I believe God, help me. I'm putting faith in what you said in your word. Please help me. But I believe that you love me. I believe I have your attention. My, God, my emotions are telling me different. I got thoughts in my head that are telling me different, but I don't believe those thoughts. God, I believe that you love me. Guys, this world needs us to be soldiers. Let's run this race well. I love you guys so much. Launch out into the deep today. Don't just sit on YouTube all day long watching YouTube videos. Go to the secret place, get out in the woods, go to the beach, go somewhere, go fishing. Do something besides watching YouTube all day. And we'll see you guys on the next video.